Well, welcome everyone to the virtual world of the Eastside Freedom Library. Uh, I'm Peter Ratcliffe, the co-executive director. Um, we are recording tonight's uh, program. You should be aware of that. And the recording will eventually end up on our YouTube channel. Um, the Eastside Freedom Library's mission is to inspire solidarity, work for justice, and advocate for equity for all. Um, underlying or interwoven with all of that is our belief that the Eastside Freedom Library should be a place where knowledge is not only accessed, but also produced, and that people from all walks of life produce knowledge in different ways. And so tonight's program is an interesting, I think, part of that path towards the production of knowledge. We're delighted to be hosting um, Ali and Micah Caldwell, who are sitting in their home in Chicago, Illinois. Um, and Ali and Micah have come to us uh, through the good graces of a very important collaborator of ours, John McKenzie. Um, John has cataloged a significant share of the 26,000 books um, that now salute on our shelves and introduced us to Ali and Micah. Um, Ali and Micah are here tonight to share with us information from their book, Brains Explained, a book that scrutinizes the sometimes dubious history of brain science from a modern perspective, wanders through explanations about how our senses might trick us into believing some wild things. And it also speculates about whether we'll be able to upload our consciousness to the matrix and many more. Um, we think this is an important part of contemporary popular science. Um, we should all have an intelligent relationship with our brains um, and perhaps think about the brains of other creatures, human and other um, at the same time. Um, Ali uh, Caldwell graduated from MIT in the field of brain and cognitive sciences. She obtained her PhD at University of California, San Diego in the field of neuroscience. Her research focused on the role of astrocytes in development and neurogenitive diseases. Maybe tonight we'll learn what an astrocyte is. Um, I didn't look it up. Um, these days, she's a senior science writer at an academic medical center where she covers basic science and clinical research for the hospital and biological sciences department. Her partner, Micah, um, claims to do the heavy lifting of filming, editing, and animating their videos, as well as co-hosting their videos on psychology and therapy. Micah is a licensed professional clinical counselor in California, has an MS in clinical mental health counseling, and currently provides therapy to primarily college students. Um, he also brews his own beer, which, which we would not mind getting a taste of uh, when next they come and visit Uncle John uh, in St. Paul. So I have only tonight learned, and I'm trying to get over my envy, that Ali and Micah's YouTube project, Neurotransmissions, um, has 140,000 subscribers, most of them Americans, but significant numbers of them from around the world. And um, I try to control my jealousy, but I have to admit, um, I am jealous. Um, so the plan for tonight is Ali and Micah are going to present some of their work to us. Um, they have encouraged us and us being my colleague, Carla Reilly, uh, who's handling the tech, uh, Carla and me, 
Uh, they've encouraged us to field questions as they come in. And while you are uh, rendered invisible and, um, and muted, uh, you can use the chat function here on Zoom or the comment function on Facebook. And Ali and Micah say, if you wanna post questions, they'll try to integrate the questions into their presentation and we'll take them as we go. Um, uh, we hope that towards the end of this evening's program, we will stop recording and encourage you all to reveal yourselves. Um, we'll find out who's in his or her pajamas. Um, and we might have a little bit of informal conversation um, after the formal program is over. So um, without further ado, let me turn things over to, to Ali and Micah um, for their presentation. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Um, so just to reiterate, my name is Micah. I'm Ali. This is Ali. And um, we're going to be talking about our book that we recently published in May. June. 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 Mm -hmm. uh, called Brains Explained. Um, and uh, this book, I guess, came out of our YouTube work, actually. Uh, and thank you for posting the link. If you want to check out the channel, it's in the chat uh, for those of you on Zoom. Um, we were, do you want to tell the story of how we kind of yeah. came to write this? Yeah, Neuro, Neurotransmission started as a joint project when I was uh, in graduate school when we were living in San Diego. Micah has had a long interest in video uh, filmmaking, editing, and I've always had an interest in writing and we decided to combine our skills um, and started, you know, just for fun, made a couple of videos about the brain together and then decided to make it um, more of a project. And we just started making videos, you know, created the channel and it's just been growing steadily ever since then. Um, we would started in 2015 and, uh, you know, not, have not really had like a viral video or anything. All of our audience has just been growth over time. And what we really aim to do with our YouTube channel with everything that we, we create is uh, to create free educational resources for people who want to learn more about their brains. And something that we try to do with our platform is making sure that we're contextualizing the science within you know, society and culture. So we don't just talk about you know, the research or the facts about the brain, but also talking about, you know, we've done videos about the, the neuroscience of cannabis and, and why was cannabis outlawed and you know all of these different kind of culturally relevant aspects of it because we want people to understand that science doesn't exist in a vacuum um, and when it came to writing the book brains explained um, we were approached in the summer of 2019 by weldon owen which is a publishing company who, uh, they had found our youtube channel and wanted to know if we were interested in writing a book and we worked with them to develop our pitch and to put together a proposal and ended up, uh, funnily enough, we signed our contract in February of 2020. So conveniently, conveniently we suddenly had a lot of time on our hands to uh, we write had the book. already planned a pretty, uh, pretty quiet summer, spring and summer of that year, because we knew we were going to be writing a book. And um, Luckily for us, we were not traveling much in yes. 2020. And so over the course of about nine months, we wrote all 256 pages of Brains Explained, which covers a lot of topics that we talk about in our videos and a lot of topics that we haven't covered in our videos and really just tries to provide this sort of, um, you know, a lot of little anecdotes and stories about the brain, you know, in history, the brain now, and the brain, you know, where we think our research, the brain is going in the future. Uh, in psychology and in neuroscience. Yeah, we, we, we went into the book sort of knowing that, and apologies for the cat meowing in the background <laughs> who wants to be on screen, but uh, we, we know that the brain can be, um, can appear a bit inaccessible at times uh, just because it seems very complex. Uh, there, there's a lot of new research constantly coming out um, and also you talk about things like astrocytes and you have no idea what, what they're actually talking about. Um, and so our goal with the book was really to um, break it down and, and make things really accessible, uh, uh, sort of simplify to a particular degree um, without losing the, the meat of uh, what we're trying to get across um, so that 
everyone can learn about their brain. And that's sort of the goal of our YouTube channel too, is to, um, I guess, show that like, you know, everybody's got a brain. And so everybody should know a little bit more about their brain. Mm -hmm. So um, it was really great working with our editor team. Um, the book, just to kind of give a brief overview, we, we sort of broke it up into three sections. Um, one that covers history. So everything sort of leading up to modern day. Um, one that covers sort of where we're at currently in terms of our understanding and then looking towards the future and, and a bit of speculation about um, where brain science is going more or less. We make fun of Elon Musk about We make fun of Elon Musk about Yeah, exactly. But um, what I really love is that with our book, uh, it's very visual. So uh, in addition to getting plenty of text about all sorts of aspects of the brain, um, you know, we worked with a, a um, designer who was able to sort of bring our, what we're talking about to life um, through imagery, through, um, you know, a lot of really eye-catching uh, uh, images and just, it brings the whole thing together, we think, in a really fun uh, read. Yeah. So. yeah. yeah. So we thought that um, today we would read a couple of sections of our book. Mm -hmm. And if you have questions that come up while we're reading uh, that you want us to talk about, definitely feel free to drop those in the chat. And otherwise, we'll just discuss the sections in a little bit more depth after we've read them. Because most of the sections in our book are under 500 words, which means that um, you know we try to make sure we cover all the important stuff. But of course, there's always more to talk about. Before we start reading, I want to explain what an astrocyte is. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. So, you know, when people talk about neuroscience, you typically think of neurons because, you know, the name neuroscience. So when you think of the brain, you think of neurons. Neurons are these electrically active cells that send all the signals to keep us walking and talking. So obviously they are exceedingly important, but a lot of people don't know that actually only about half of the cells in your brain are neurons. And there are all of these other cells in your brain that are there to kind of help support and maintain your neurons and make sure that they continue to function the way that they're supposed to function. So these other cells are collectively known as glia, which literally means brain glue, because we didn't think that they really did anything other than act as a scaffolding for neurons. But in the last like 30 years, we started to learn all these really important things about the roles of glia in the brain. So when I was in graduate school, I studied a particular cell type called the astrocyte and was really looking at how astrocytes influence how neurons connect with one another and how neurons communicate with each other. Because we now realize these cells are actually really active. They're not electrical, so they don't react as quickly as neurons do or send the same kinds of signals, but they play a really important role in how neurons are connected with one another and how they communicate with each other throughout the lifetime. That's just one type Good of glial cell. There are a bunch of other glial cells out there. Other glial cells include microglia and <laughs> oligodendrocytes yeah. and all that good stuff. All kinds of fun stuff. Yeah. So with that, why don't we um, read a little bit from the book? I thought, um, sure. I thought a topic that would be interesting to start with is the topic of lobotomies, um, which is a pretty... Uh, graphic. A pretty graphic topic. So I want to warn folks that it is fairly fairly graphic if that makes you uncomfortable. Um, but I think it's a really important topic because it sort of highlights the challenges that were faced by physicians at that time, as well as being a really good example of a pretty big mistake that we made in medical history. Um, so this was a se segment that we called a whole lot of note lobotomies. And to, and just to reiterate, feel free to leave um, questions or comments in the chat as we're going through this, and we'll try and get to those as we're chatting yeah so lobotomies were all the rage in the 1940s hailed as a miracle cure for all kinds of mental illnesses and psychiatric breakdowns but since performing a lobotomy essentially entailed jamming an ice pick into someone's skull and swiping it around to destroy part of the prefrontal cortex the fad passed pretty quickly this procedure initially known as a leucotomy was developed by portuguese scientist antonio igas moniz uh, based on research showing that destroying a chimpanzee's frontal lobe could subdue its aggressive behavior. 
In the early 1940s, American doctors James Watts and Walter Freeman developed a similar surgery, first using alcohol injections to directly kill brain tissue, and later using a modified ice pick to go in through the eye socket and cut up the brain. Watts and Freeman reported that over 60% of their patients were, quote, improved after surgery, though they did note, as did Moniz, funnily enough, that after surgery, the patient's behavior frequently became more blunt and disinhibited. Oh, and one in seven patients just straight up died which is a pretty serious side effect. A surgery like the lobotomy was super appealing for many, mostly because it was really difficult for most people, especially if they weren't white or wealthy, to get any kind of mental health care. The only option for many was institutionalization, but it wasn't great. Hospitals were overcrowded and patients were often kept isolated and physically restrained. In the face of such conditions, it's not hard to see why turning a difficult or dangerous patient into a more docile one would be so appealing even if it came with the risk of turning them into a vegetable. If you're on the fence about this whole lobotomy thing, one major red flag is how frequently they were performed on people already pathologized by society as different, meaning they had behaviors or beliefs that didn't adhere to the era's strict social norm. In fact, a lot of lobotomies were performed on women who were expected to recover relatively easily and go back to their household duties. If you think it can't get worse than this, it does. Lobotomies were often done to children as well to make them more docile. In fact, Freeman himself thought that African-Americans and particularly African-American women were the best patients for lobotomy because they were the most likely to have a supportive family at home provide them with lifelong care. This makes it all the more upsetting that the procedure was so popular that Antonio Igas Moniz actually won the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1949 because of his discovery of the therapeutic value of leucotomy in certain psychoses. Yeah, some pretty big mistakes were made. Eventually, concerns about the method of performing lobotomy, as well as growing discomfort with negative outcomes of the procedure, made many doctors uneasy. Then, in 1950, a new drug called chlor... Oh, boy, I don't know how to say this out loud. Chlorpromazine. Chlorpromazine was invented. Sorry. Chlorpromazine. Chlorpromazine was invented, an antipsychotic drug that was hailed as a miracle for treating schizophrenia. More and more doctors began pointing out that the lobotomy had essentially no scientific basis. By the 1970s, it was outlawed in many countries and U.S. states and has since been determined to be appropriate in only extremely rare cases. So uh, when we were researching that section of the book, you know, I didn't go into it thinking I was going to like suddenly become a fan of lobotomies, but it was especially interesting when I learned that, yes, it was bad and it was even worse when you figure out how, uh, who it was mostly being applied to. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but it's a real, you know, like we said in the book, it's a real challenge because they didn't really have tools at that time to provide care for people. Um, and I think it's a really interesting thing to contrast with some of the changes in mental health care and, and behavioral science in general now, you know, whereas we talked about lobotomies were sometimes applied to people who had been pathologized for not meaning a strict social norm. And we've seen this throughout the history of brain science that, you know, people, especially I think in Western culture, people are, are um, you know, kind of shunned if they don't behave according to strict norms. But there's now been a growing shift toward accepting more neurodiversity and a growing awareness that people who don't behave exactly the way you're supposed to behave can just be left alone and let to do their own thing and don't necessarily need to be pathologized or locked up. Right. Right, differences are a, a, a bit more accepted, hopefully, mm -hmm. not not pathologized and changed. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting thinking about lobotomies and, and sort of seeing the history that leads up to that. Because obviously, prior to lobotomies coming into popularity, we still had people drilling holes in heads. Uh, we talk about that a little bit here too about um, trepanation mm -hmm. and you know that being used. Uh, to great effect in some situations for, um, you know, when you had brain injuries and there was swelling of the brain, people would use it to relieve that pressure, but also it would be used for kind of frivolous things too, you know, uh, sometimes for religious ceremonies and that sort of thing, but also because it was thought that it would release spirits and that sort of thing. So um, kind of interesting to see how, you know, medical science improved over time and, and we see this introduction of lobotomies that you know, uh, was hailed as this excellent advancement, and, and yet uh, it still had this catastrophic social cost. So, yeah.
I think it's also a good example of how a lot of um, a lot of people with significant, you know, neurological issues or, or mental illnesses were really not seen as people because it was hailed as this miracle cure that made it easier for other people to care for them, um, but didn't really care about their own well-being. And the fact that I mean, he won a Nobel Prize right. for this, um, which I just think is so fascinating and there's like a whole other conversation to be had about the nobel prize as an institution whether or not that's the best way to acknowledge significant um scientific contributions considering that very few scientific discoveries are made by single people um but yeah i just think it's a really very telling about how people uh viewed the mentally ill at that time um, but, you know, they, actually, this time I didn't make it in the book, something that I thought was really fascinating researching this too, was that part of why the lobotomy fell out of fashion was because doctors in the Soviet Union were not comfortable with it. Oh, wow. That they were like, yeah, we think this is bad, actually, and we're not going to do it. And then there was kind of this like growing pushback of like, hey, if people in the Soviet Union aren't doing it, maybe we also shouldn't be doing it. Interesting. Looks like we got a few comments. Yeah. Um, so Ken asks, I recall hearing interviews with patients who received a lobotomy using the eye socket method. Great bitterness expressed by these people. I bet. Yeah, I mean, so if you go through um, the eye, you can get directly to the brain. We all, um, and, and obviously you're just accessing a different part of the brain that's sort of on the underside of the prefrontal cortex there. Frontal lobe. Frontal lobe. Mm -hmm. um, uh, also, in, in the book, we talk about um, in how in ancient Egypt, you know, they would take out the brain typically through the nose, um, and in order to do that, they actually have to remove like a, a bone that's there in order to uh, push through and, and access the brain. And I don't know if that's true for the eye. I think you can go straight to it. Yeah. So it's interesting. Tess asked if we've heard of a lore episode on the body. I have not. I've listened to lore. I stopped listening a while ago, so I don't. I don't think I listened to the lobotomy episode, but I'll have to go back and listen. I bet it's pretty dark. Yeah. If any, it, if I mean, any, if what I've learned about lobotomy is, is anything to indicate, it's probably not very. Pleasant. And lore is a horror podcast. Oh, so okay. It's <laughs> definitely. Uh, Ken says many people receiving serious mental health procedures were powerless, and decisions were made for them. Yeah, and and frankly, that still happens today. Yeah, that um, you I was just listening to um, a story uh, a couple days ago about how this is a big issue actually right now uh, in nursing homes, mm -hmm. how um, when, when many people in nursing homes uh, start to develop dementia or Alzheimer's, typically they're given antipsychotic medication and are diagnosed with schizophrenia, despite never having been diagnosed with schizophrenia in the past, right? And this is part of a loophole in the system where if, if a nursing home, uh, nursing homes have to report when they give patients antipsychotic medications, unless, they're, there's, unless a there's a diagnosis. So, uh, so they give the diagnosis in order to be able to pacify patients by giving them Haldol or something like that. Uh, and it's it's killing people, you know, yeah. it's really bad for them. Well, it's really tough too. I mean, I I witnessed this as a family member of mine too. Some people react really poorly to antipsychotics. Right. Right. It makes things a lot worse. And then they just keep throwing more drugs at the person and it just really leads to a huge deterioration. But I mean, I think this is true even I mean, I think that the whole thing happening with Britney Spears right now is a really good example. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not as extreme as a as a lobotomy, but you know, she had a severe mental health crisis years ago and was, you know, put in a position where she's no longer able to make choices for herself. Right. And she, you know, may have severe mental illness, but it's not necessarily a reason to not give someone their own autonomy. Right, right. This is a big discussion in mental health treatment generally, which is, you know, how, how to retain autonomy, you know, how to make sure that people feel like they are making their own decisions while also measuring that against the, the risk that they're being put in. Um, and it's a difficult topic. And we frankly don't have the um, framework, the ethical framework to, to be right 100% of the time. Yeah. So it's tough. Uh, John asked, how did the performance of lobotomy on a child affect brain development? 
Um, so it was relatively common to perform lobotomies on uh, children who had behavioral issues. Um, so the prefrontal cortex, the part that is you know, affected by lobotomy, this is the part of the brain that is mostly linked to things like decision-making, um, planning. Uh, it's, you know, it's a lot of these higher order cognitive functions that we think of as being really key to being human. Mm -hmm. Personality, you know, somebody mentioned Phineas Gage in the chat, a classic example of someone who had a frontal lobe injury and a personality change. So in a child, um, you know, the thing that's really interesting about children's brains, depending on the age, you know, with kids, they can actually have had severe brain injuries at a very young age and recover remarkably. So there have actually been procedures done where um, due to severe epilepsy, children have an entire hemisphere, an entire half of their brain removed to try and, and prevent seizures and actually end up being, you know, basically normal, have normal cognitive function. Um, but you know, even so, uh, losing a significant portion of your brain that is responsible for things like decision making and planning, um, you know, long term is going to have some serious effects on that. I mean, you're essentially, you're, you're creating a person who is not really ever going to be able to fully focus on things or to, you know, fully process information. Like you're just damaging this really critical portion of the brain that is what lets us you know, be independent, decisive people. Mm -hmm. Well, and even back in that day when, we, when lobotomies were at their peak, we didn't necessarily know what that part of the brain did. We just knew that if you did the thing that you squished around, then, then the person would become more docile without realizing all of the functions that go along with that. And in kids, you know, if you're causing damage, that's, that's tissue damage. Like that's, that's different than you know, removing a whole hemisphere, you can still have some neuroplasticity there um, to change and develop over time, so. Yeah, so Peter asked about how, so I think this is actually a good point to maybe read another section, but I think sure. this is a question that we're gonna keep talking about. The question is, how has thinking about the relationship between the biology of the brain and mental health and emotions changed over time? Mm. It's actually really re relevant to our most recent video, I think. That's true. Um, but why don't you, this is going to be your session, so I need to read this one. And this I'll, one? Yeah. Um, so this doesn't necessarily it doesn't relate directly address to this, but it'll come back to it. Peter's question, but we will come back to it. Um, but it but it does, I think, um, it's it's a modern day um, issue that has been coming up, I think, more and more lately, it's which is uh, should police respond to mental health crises? Uh, so let me read this out. Mental health situations are responsible for almost one in 10 calls to police. This means that police officers are often the first to respond to someone in crisis. Unfortunately, this can have tragic consequences. While only 3% of Americans suffer from a severe mental illness, they make up 25 to 50% of fatal law enforcement encounters. This issue is only magnified for individuals with other marginalized identities who are more likely to experience violence at the hands of law enforcement officials. Many police agencies have offered psychiatric response training to interested officers and even hired mental health professionals. However, most agencies struggle to implement the training and in real life situations, officers often fail to notice that mental illness is involved. Additionally, because police feel they have few other options, people in crisis are frequently needlessly arrested and taken to jail. This has led to many questions. Uh, this has led many to question whether police should be involved in responding to mental health crises that they are not well equipped to handle. The alternative is to create something new. Medical emergencies such as heart attacks, strokes, and other non-vehicular accidents are handled by paramedics, not a police officer. As such, one proposal is to create a mobile crisis response team made up of mental health professionals, community health workers, and peers who have the knowledge and skills to appropriately de-escalate crisis situations and connect folks with resources. No police. With this empathetic approach, we could avoid unnecessary hospitalizations, decrease arrests, and most importantly, save lives. Could this be the future of mental health crisis response? So I expanded on this uh, section in a video later on, actually, because it, it um, really spoke to me and it was uh, something that I thought was worth exploring in more depth. What's the issue that 
your colleagues have dealt with. Right. And that I, I've personally dealt with, you know, when, when I have worked with, I've worked with a wide array of clients, folks who have severe mental health issues uh, with the homeless population, with people who have been recently incarcerated and no surprise, there's a big overlap between all of those different uh, groups. And so, um, you know, I've witnessed firsthand that like, when someone is in crisis, uh, the only emergency uh, assistance that you can call for is the police. And unfortunately, we're just not that well equipped, uh, or the police aren't that well equipped to, to be able to deal with mental health crises. Now in San Diego, where we were living, um, they have this team called the Psychiatric Emergency Response Team. And, <laughs> ooh, bless you. and, and they are better because they have an, an actual um, uh, licensed therapist on the team who goes with the police and does the primary contact. The problem with that, though, is that this is one team for the entire region. And so you have, you know, 10 cars, 10 police cars that are out in, in a county and one of them is uh, dealing with all mental health crises. And so what we would find often is you would call for uh, the psychiatric emergency response team and you would get a, a normal police officer showing up at the scene who doesn't have the training. Um, anyway, this is all to say that, that it seems like uh, something needs to change in this area where we're um, arming, or not arming, where we're, we're giving uh, the appropriate resources for addressing mental health crises that um, doesn't require this sort of um, use of force, you know, that doesn't require um, police officers to show up, because as, as you can imagine, that's pretty st uh, stigmatizing. You know, when a police officer shows up to a situation, typically it involves a, a legal issue, right? Um, a law was broken, um, or someone is in trouble. Mm -hmm. And so if you have a police officer show up for a mental health crisis, well, how's the person going to react? They're going to think that they're in trouble and there's something that, that you know, as such that can lead to um, more escalation, yeah, escalation and, and actions that perhaps they wouldn't normally engage in, such as running away or becoming aggressive, that sort of thing. Well, this is, you know, there have been some, you know, I don't know if anyone's done a study on this, but there have been, you know, cases where even when police do respond and are trying to handle a de-escalation in a mental health crisis, that they actually end up being punished for not right. acting more aggressively toward the person. Um, and you know, people die because of this, which I think is a huge part of this issue, right? No, it's not, being mentally ill shouldn't be a death sentence. And uh, one of the things that Mike and I were just talking about earlier today is, you know, one of the challenges here is that institutionalization in America was really bad, you know, when we had mental health, you know, these mental hospitals, they were generally really bad. Psychiatric asylums. Psychiatric asylums. But when they closed, now there was nothing. Now there's no resources for people who have severe mental illness who, you know, maybe can't quite be independent, but don't, their families don't have the resources or the capacity to care for them the way that they need to be cared for. And so part of the problem is that our society isn't built to support, you know, it's not a very large percentage of our society, but it's not built to support these people in the way they need to be supported. Mm -hmm. And this is why you often see people like clients Micah used to work with who, you know, chronically homeless, dealing with a lot of incarceration issues, a lot of encounters with law enforcement, because they're not quite capable of being independent entirely, but there's no, no good resources for them. And it's sort of one of the tragedies of living in a system where we decided that we just, you know, it's so for some reason it's better to keep harassing people who are homeless mm -hmm. rather than like providing them with a home and the resources they need to succeed. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that also contributes enormously to this issue. Absolutely. I mean, just mm -hmm. a, a short history lesson. So the deinstitutionalization movement happened around the 60s, I think, 70s. Um, I could be totally off on that, but uh, it was this push to close all of these asylums. And the reason was that um, they were seen as costly. They were seen as um, uh, like these unethical places where people were treated very badly. Um, and around the same time as this movement was going, we saw some other instigating factors. Ken actually mentioned one flew over the cuckoo's nest. That was one of the primary things that really pushed the deinstitutionalization movement. 
that um, you know it was seen as the, these horrible places. And um, there was a promise made that we would close these institutions and instead replace them with community services, which is great. You know, it sounds wonderful, but unfortunately there was no funding put aside for that. And so what ended up happening was people left the institutions and then ended up on the street. And so oftentimes when, when you look at the homeless population today, these are probably, you know, many of them have mental health uh, concerns and uh, it's not too hard to see that these are the same folks that would have been in something like a psychiatric institution. So anyway, uh, not to say that there weren't issues with psychiatric institutions yeah. back in the day, right? But, but, uh, but there are questions about, right, whether that resource was valuable and whether perhaps it should even be brought back in a different form. Yeah, well, I think it, um, you know, sort of speaks to this broader issue with just needing to create more supports for people who don't fit with like mainstream uh, mainstream ideas of how one is supposed to behave. Hmm. Um, you know, I, I, I had an experience a couple of years ago where I had an interaction with someone who had a serious mental health crisis and I took them to an emergency room and even the, the emergency room staff were not capable of dealing with it because they just didn't have the training to identify it. So they were, you know, this person had some severe delusions and they were treating this person's delusions as being, you know, reality. And I'm like, no, this person is having a mental health crisis. This is not what's right. actually happening. You need to treat this as a mental health issue, not as a physical health issue. And it's just a really, I think, I think I, I'm glad there are more conversations about mental health broadly, because I hope that, you know, change is slow, but hopefully it will actually happen. I had some good comments. Yeah, I see a couple comments about obviously what, uh, what's been going on in Minneapolis, right? Um, so Tess sharing about, um, let's see. Dosing people with ketamine, not wow. just because of mental health. It's interesting. I mean, actually one so, of the things we're gonna talk about in a little bit is ketamine and other similar drugs in a mental health context. But it is, I mean, if I'm understanding this comment correctly, man, it sounds like it's non-consensual dosing right. with ketamine. I mean, ketamine does have a history of being used as a, an, uh, uh, what's the word that I'm looking for? An anesthesia. Um, but obviously you want to make sure that you're not dosing people without their knowledge or without them consenting to it. Yeah. Um, so that happened in the mid 1990s. Wow, that is terrible. Yeah, so uh, I actually talk about this in the video that I made that expanded on this topic, but in 2016, um, the place where I was working at um, about two blocks away from there while I was at work, uh, there was a man who had a mental health crisis. He um, was walking into traffic, that sort of thing, but wasn't, you know, he wasn't aggressive or anything like that. Uh, and his sister called and told the operator, you know, my brother's having a mental breakdown and needs help. And two block police officers showed up cornered him in a parking lot and he you know in in his state of mind pulled out um a cigarette cartridge uh you know for like vaping uh and pointed it at one of the officers and he was shot and killed uh just because they they had their guns ready and and were uh scared in that situation and you know because there was this lack of understanding of how to treat this person in that crisis situation in his death so yeah I mean it's I think this is a huge a huge part of the problem is that if you give if you give a person a gun every person is going to look like a bad guy um, to some degree and I think that you know there are a lot of cases of people committing suicide by cop and their families are just trying to get them help and um, this is a big part of why this is an issue that needs to be addressed because if you police officers are not trained to handle this police officers are trained to deal with criminals a person in a mental health crisis is not a criminal um, and it's it's really difficult uh, I think and it's difficult for everyone you know like I can't imagine being a police officer who kills someone in the middle of a mental health crisis um, and has to live with that um, but uh, coming back to the, the ketamine issue too, I mean, my reaction to that is I don't think that police officers should be directing anyone's medical care. Uh, I think that, you know, unless they have medical training themselves, 
Um, and I think that's a, a, a pretty big concern. Um, and, and again, I think it's more evidence why you need to have mental health experts present in these situations. You know, if, if people are having mental health issues and, and there's this idea that they need to be sedated, then maybe you should have someone there who has the training to de-escalate an interaction rather than trying to rely on, on pharmaceuticals. Do you want to move on to the next section perhaps? Yeah, so this is this is tangentially related and I do not want to equate the uh, non-consensual application of ketamine uh, with yeah. what we're going to be talking about, but actually, you know, and, and, I, and I wonder if this is some of, um, if this, you know, sort of why this is happening is related to, uh, related to the growing use of, of ketamine in mental health treatment. Mm -hmm. So um, the next section we're going to read is called Street Drugs in the Doctor's Office, and it's about some of the innovative new um, psychiatric uh, treatments available uh, for, for people dealing with mental illness. So, while your hippie aunt may have been preaching the values of tripping on shrooms for mental wellness since the 70s, thanks to a lot of in misinformation, racism, and anti-counterculture sentiment in various world governments, most of the drugs we consider psychoactive have been illegal and nearly impossible to study in a clinical setting for decades. Some of that is changing now, which is great news because some of these mind altering substances seem to be pretty helpful for treating a lot of neurological and mood disorders. There's even a whole organization dedicated to this cause. The Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies or MAPS is dedicated to supporting research and public understanding of why tripping might be good for you. So the Kush Vulcuria, cannabis generally better known as marijuana has quite the sordid reputation. Thanks a lot, Reefer Madness. There's a reason that this good, good herb has been legalized for medical use in 35 states. The two main components of cannabis are del delta-9 tetrahydrocannabidiol, or THC, and cannabidiol, or CBD. Both affect the endocannabinoid system, which is pretty multifaceted. It plays a role in cognition, pain perception, and motor movements. Cannabis has been investigated for its potential to treat nausea, improve appetite, and treat chronic pain and anxiety, but the government's resistance to allowing research has made it hard to determine how well it works, at least so far. Probably the most well-studied well medical use for cannabis is the utility of CBD for preventing seizures in some severe forms of epilepsy. Go ask Alice to be your therapist. The more traditional psychedelics like LSD and psilocybin, aka magic mushrooms, were touted early on as potential miracle drugs because of their profound effects on the mind, including dramatic shifts in perception, mood, cognition, behavior, and even spiritual experience. Beyond recreational use, researchers are working to understand whether these drugs might be helpful for treating serious mental health conditions. Most of the trials so far have been pretty small, but have had promising results. Psilocybin has been found to be extremely effective for breaking nicotine addictions, while a single dose of LSD was effective at reducing alcohol consumption in alcoholics. So far, it looks like these drugs, along with psychotherapy, may be helpful in treatment-resistant depression, anxiety, and drug dependence. The love drug, MDMA, also known as ecstasy, earned that nickname for a reason. It induces feelings of euphoria, energy, and enhanced empathy. These effects are why it's being explored as a means to treat certain mood disorders, and has even received special approval as a breakthrough therapy from the FDA for treating PTSD. Thanks to the ways in which MDMA enhances trust and reduces feelings of fear, MDMA-assisted therapy is being used to help patients struggling with psychological trauma and to support the terminally ill as they come to terms with their death. And finally, special K for special kids. Historically, ketamine has been used as an anesthetic, providing pain relief and sedation in medical settings. Recently, it started to gain a reputation for the dramatic benefits it seems to have in cases of severe depression and suicidal ideation. Clinical trials have found that a single dose of ketamine can rapidly lift depression, taking just a few hours to do what most antidepressants can't do in weeks or even months. Most of the evidence indicates that the effects can also last for weeks to months. So there you go. So this is a topic also that I expanded on a little bit in a different video um, about the scheduling system mm -hmm. and just how like, you know, we have some of these drugs that are uh, illegal that are, um, you know, uh, controlled substances, right. That are, uh, schedule one substances. And what that does is it really severely limits research ability, um, for like medical use, uh, because part of the qualifier is that they are a schedule one drug if they have no medical use, according to the government. 
Um, but how can you figure out if it has a medical use if you can't study it? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so, so this is part of the catch-22 is like, okay, by putting it on schedule one, you're effectively se severely limiting research and, and therefore it's less likely to be removed from that category. Um, so MDMA, and, and I guess one other factor of this is like how these drugs have been illegalized uh, through panic, essentially like moral panics, um, or through racism, or through you know, um, uh, you know, reactions to counterculture. A great example is with MDMA, where uh, it was used for years uh, by therapists. Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, it was not a party drug. It was not uh, a party drug. Actually. It was it was called empathy. Actually, that was the name that it had. Uh, that it was commonly used as and it was used legally by therapists and was seen as very effective for facilitating sessions and then it got picked up by the counterculture movement and became a sort of rave drug and as soon as that happened the government said all right we're you know schedule one drug so but a really common misconception about a lot of these drugs that i think you know probably a fair number of people know yes you're aware of is they're really not dangerous, at least not in the way that um, you know we think of danger. Um, and, I, and I think it's especially important to contextualize that compared to things that are completely legal and easy to access in our society, like alcohol and nicotine. I mean, caffeine, coffee is more deadly than psilocybin. Like, you know, it's easier to overdose on caffeine than it is to overdose on psilocybin. Um, MDMA is probably the riskiest of the drug. I mean, ketamine too. You know, these drugs can have dramatic effects at extremely high doses, but at the doses that we're talking about for therapeutic effects, they're really very safe. Um, and so it's, you know, one of the reasons I think we've both been really excited to see this growing body of research showing this potential. And, you know, in addition to Micah's video about their use in therapy and this challenge with the scheduling system, we did a video about the neuroscience of psychedelics in general, but this also applies to MDMA and ketamine. And so, you know, what these drugs do, you know, the, the challenge with a lot of the drugs that we use to treat mental disorders, such as anxiety and depression related conditions like PTSD or addiction, um, we don't understand the brain chemistry of these conditions well enough to really know how to adequately treat them. We don't really know exactly what's going on in the brains to cause these conditions. You know, for a long time, we thought the depression was caused by a lack of serotonin. And so we started using these drugs called SSRIs, which means selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors that are supposed to increase the serotonin um, in your brain. And now we don't actually think that it's necessarily a serotonin imbalance. Now we think that it's more related to structural and signal, other signaling issues. But these SSRIs do seem to help to some degree, um, you know, but the effect isn't that strong and it doesn't work for everybody. It takes a long time to find the right fit for some people to find the right drug to alleviate symptoms. And so some of these drugs like ketamine or actually we didn't talk about it in the book, but nitrous oxide, which, you know, colloquially is known as whippets, um, is incredibly effective at rapidly lifting depression symptoms. And the reason it's really important to explore things like this is, you know, some people don't have two months or six months to find a drug that's going to work for them, that's going to help their mental illness. You know, some people are in a crisis and they really need help now to, to help their depression. And uh, having options that can really rapidly alleviate those symptoms is really important um, because, you know, if someone's dealing with suicidal thoughts, you, you can't expect them to wait two months for a drug to kick in. Um, and so I think it's really, um, really important that we address these issues like the scheduling system and really, you know, kind of confront our biases and think about why, why are we scared of these things? And are, is it based in a, in, a, in a reasonable fear or is it based on sort of this socially ingrained idea of how we should feel about these substances? And then think about, you know, okay, what can they actually be used for? Like, I'm not saying you should like, you know, go out, go do out and drugs. do a bunch of shrooms or whatever. I mean, if you want to, fine, do whatever. But <laughs> My point is that I just think that it's a really valuable opportunity because they're clearly incredibly powerful. And you know, some of the things we didn't really talk as much in depth about all the different uses, but for example, you know, psilocybin is being used to help terminal cancer patients, you know, come to terms with their terminal cancer mm -hmm. and to, you know, be comfortable with that. And, and people who 
have, have undergone this treatment have found it to be incredibly effective and have you know said that they are no longer afraid of dying after this experience. Mm -hmm. Really interestingly, not as really as mental health, but there have also been really interesting studies about the relationship between spirituality and psychedelics. Mm -hmm. um, just looking at you know how how using psychedelics can induce these spiritual experiences and how they can affect the spiritual experiences of people you know with different religious beliefs and, and spiritual um, spiritual values which I also think is really fascinating because I think it says a lot about the power of our brains and um, you know how our brains help us understand and interact with the information that we have uh, in our lives and you know just like meditation or sleeping or whatever it's another way to experience consciousness that can maybe provide valuable insights, whether for mental health or just for general well-being and, and self-awareness. Definitely. Yeah. How are we doing on time, by the way? Are you okay? I think, okay. Yeah, I think we're about half an hour. We could maybe read another section if folks want, or we can just chat with people. I think, I think maybe one more, one more reading. Sounds yeah. great. great. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Thank Let's you. See. Sure. Unless you got something else to talk about. No, no, I think I think we can talk about this. Maybe I'll do both of these. That sounds good. Those about the key, I think. Okay. All right. Um, so this section is uh, all about IQ. IQ tests supposedly measure a person's cognitive ability and give a score that represents their intelligence and future potential. But when we talk about a person's IQ or intelligence quotient, we may not be talking about the same thing. Psychologists have developed hundreds of tests like the Stanford Binet intelligence tests, uh, intelligence scales, the Weschler adult intelligence scale, the Woodcock Johnson test, the cognitive assessment system, the list goes on and on. Despite what an IQ test might make you think, a concrete measure of intelligence is nearly impossible given its abstract nature. What are we even talking about when we say intelligence? There's little, in, there's little agreement on the standard de definition of intelligence, so every test measures something different, though they often fail to measure broader categories of intelligence like creativity and social intelligence. Likewise, IQ tests don't typically account for factors that can impact a person's IQ, including culture, environment, educational access or background, and even nutrition. And on the darker side, IQ tests have historically been used to justify the eugenics movement and discrimination against minority groups and disabled folks. Needless to say, these scores can cause harm if used inappropriately. So you might be asking yourself, okay, so if all these tests are insufficient, what's the future of IQ tests? Here's a thought. What if we just stopped using them? IQ tests are kind of outdated and horrible for predicting a person's future success. And yet that's how they're used in schools and employment services. The goal has always been to measure general intelligence, yet they all fall short. Specific tests or specific tasks seems fine, but let's just crap, scrap IQ tests. So that's the section on IQ. Um, I'll, I'll read the other section here, just it, talking about, it's yeah, it's related, uh, and then we'll open up the conversation. Yeah. So um, more than one kind of intelligence, Psychologists have tried to come up with alternatives to the general intelligence model, like Gardner's theory of multiple intelligences, which posits that people have different kinds of intelligences, like musical rhythmic, visual spatial, verbal linguistic, logical mathematical, bodily kinesthetic, and so on. This means someone could be very intelligent in certain areas that are not traditionally identified in an IQ test. Unfortunately, while the theory sounds great, there's little empirical evidence to support it. However, others have glommed onto the idea and have proposed new kinds of intelligence that have become widely popular, like emotional intelligence, or EQ. Developed in the 1990s, EQ describes our ability to perceive, control, and assess emotions uh, that's essential for interacting with others in the world. Is it real? Who knows? Some people are more emotionally attuned, but it's debatable whether EQ is a truly distinct form of intelligence or just a skill or personal trait. So I thought um, we, we wrote about this because I think people put a lot of stock into IQ. Uh, you know, it's, it's used to, I don't know, demonstrate something about, yeah, you get into Mensa, you 
get a high enough score on the IQ test or people will take an online IQ test and say, oh, I scored a, a 120, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and I guess it's just questionable, you know, when, when we're looking at this in terms of how accurate uh, it actually is at measuring what it proposes it's measuring. So when we're talking about general intelligence or Spearman's G, as you would call it, um, it's this idea that like we all possess a, uh, we're, we're predisposed to a certain level of intelligence, but it's impossible to distinguish your like inherent intelligence from all of the other social factors that are at play in life, right? And so how do you, you can't tease that apart. Um, and so that's why I think IQ tests are useless. <laughs> so. Well, I think it's also a really prime example of a thing that was developed with a very specific population in mind that doesn't necessarily translate to global populations. Mm -hmm. um, and this is something we've, we've been talking about, which is, um, you know, a lot of a lot of psychology research historically was done in uh, in what we call weird populations, which stands for Western, educated, industrialized, uh, rich, democratic, and a lot, you know, a lot of it like in the UK and in the US, and a lot of it was done pretty exclusively among white college students and even more exclusively among, among white male college students. And so part of the challenge here is that a lot of these assumptions we make about human psychology are based on these studies that were only done in this very limited population. And uh, you know the same thing is true with IQ. Like there are so many things that can affect that that it's just really difficult to kind of. There's no like good way to just measure everyone's intelligence because there are so many things that impact people in their development in so many different ways. Um, and and I think it just really disadvantages it disadvantages people who aren't, you know, upper middle class white people generally. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I think. You know, let's uh, we can kind of bring this back to um, Peter's question earlier about the relationship between the biology of the brain and mental health and emotions mm -hmm. changing over time. Mm -hmm. um, which is that, you know, I think I don't know if there was ever a time, you know, I mean, except for when people didn't necessarily know the brain was sort of a generation of, yeah, the seat of consciousness. consciousness. Um, I don't know that there was ever a time when we fully thought the two were separate. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that there is this growing awareness that the biology of the brain, that these like underlying and anatomical and physiological realities of your brain contribute enormously to who you are as a person. This includes, you know, mental health diagnoses, but also your personality. And this is affected by genetics, but it's also affected by environment. Mm -hmm. And it's affected by your parent, you know, by your parents environments your parents grew up in you know there's this entire field now looking at understanding how epigenetics which are these essentially short-term modifications that can affect gene expression can be passed on between generations and this is why we now know that you know people who are the descendants of you know holocaust victims have these they have markers in their genes that this happened to them this has happened in their family so we're starting to understand all of these different biological elements that we didn't know existed before and understanding the effects that those can have on us. Right, yeah, like we, we have people who survived um, uh, like severe um, food shortages and you mm -hmm. see that their children who never experienced any sort of um, hunger, you know, still have- Serious metabolic serious, changes. Yeah, metabolic changes, uh, you know, so we can see that there are, there's a lot of, in, I guess, factors at play, um, the one that comes to mind for me is, is the, um, your stomach, you know, like diet can play such a big role on your brain functioning. And there's a, a whole field that's looking into what we call the, uh, the brain gut axis mm -hmm. where, you know, most of your serotonin is actually located in, in your stomach. And, and so well, it, your, your, intestines. your intestines, and so that plays a, a huge role in, in brain functioning as well. So. Yeah, well, and, and the relationship, you know, your diet has a huge impact on your cardiovascular function and your cardiovascular function is really one of the greatest determinants of your brain health mm -hmm. um, because your brain uses a ton of energy and requires a ton of blood flow. And so 
really, you know, my mom is always asking me if this brain game or if that, you know, cool device is going to protect her brain health as she ages. And I'm like, mom, the best thing to do is aerobic exercise and a healthy diet. These are the best things you can do to protect, uh, protect your brain long-term. Right. Uh, Tess asked about Myers-Briggs. Ooh. So <laughs> personality tests are their own thing, right? Um, Okay, I will say there. Uh, not all personality tests are created equal, um, uh, and they, you know, the personality tests typically will not claim to measure intelligence in any way. Um, the Myers Briggs was developed by um, some folks who try, tried to do. You know, the Myers Briggs came into great popularity. Um, uh, modern day we've come to understand that the myers-briggs is not a great personality test even uh, in and of itself there are other personality tests that are far more um empirically based and and accurate but we i think we also understand that like personality changes and um so getting reliability with personality tests can be more difficult um but i would say iq tests claim to measure something very specific uh, or claim to measure intelligence and, and are missing the mark. Uh, whereas personality tests claim to measure, you know, whatever personality traits they're trying to identify and yeah. they can have varying levels of accuracy. I, I think say. the personality test thing, like, I think it can be really useful for people, you know, trying to kind of understand themselves. Yeah. But I think that the risk that comes along with, with you know, getting too attached to the results of the personality test can be stagnation, right? That if you really identify as like an INS, INS, INFJ or whatever, right. you know, your Myers-Briggs personality type, that that then leads to a situation where you always think of yourself as being that kind of person. Mm -hmm. And that's fine, I guess, but I think it's more exciting to think of ourselves as changeable and growing over time, you know, throughout our lifetimes, not just, you know, until we become adults. Um, and that recognizing that people change throughout the lifetime is really important for, you know, relationships and growth. Right. Yeah. I mean, personality tests are uh, a useful tool, you know, for, for opening conversation and for exploring your, yourself and your uh, inner life, I guess, in the same way that like dreams can be a useful tool if you uh, wanted to use those to sort of better understand aspects of your life, but it, it is interpretive to a certain degree. Yeah. So Peter asked about a useful way to think about intergenerational trauma oh with epigenetics yeah i think i think the thing that you know that i like to i like to keep in mind and i encourage others to keep in mind about about epigenetics or anything is you know it's always a combination of environment and genetics it is never nature or nurture it is always some combination of the two um and i think that it's really important to remember that because um you know, intergenerational trauma is real. And it, it, like I said, it, it, it can be passed down to the next generation. Um, but I think it's important for people to remember that it's not the only determining factor of, of individuals' outcomes and that things like social support and family support and personal choices all really matter long-term and, and how things work out for people. Um, but, you know, your genetics and epigenetics and all of these other influences can, can lead to can lead to certain outcomes being more likely, right? So this is, you know, if you want to think about something like obesity, like this is something that can play a role that it's not, you know, you're not fated to be obese necessarily, but there are things that can make it more likely that it's a thing that will happen to you. Right. Um, so, you know, we, we talk about this in the context of like, you know, people in different, from different um, ethnic or cu cultural backgrounds it's like starting a video game on different levels of difficulty mm -hmm. um, and I think this can be applied to a lot of different situations in life whether it's like your you know your weight or your career path or whatever there's like you know some people end up unfortunately starting on you know a really hard level when other people get started on a really easy level mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they can't succeed no yeah absolutely um, but yeah so uh, I think that's all the reading we're going to do tonight. Um, thanks for the great questions. And we're happy yeah. to chat more if you have other questions about these specific topics or other brain psychology related things. Yeah, it was really awesome to get all your questions and to, to I don't know, uh, hear where your minds are at. Mm -hmm. so.